It's so cute, you guys. Look at this. Oh my gosh. I cannot believe we have these banana trees now. They look so different than what I was expecting. Oh my goodness. An absolute delicacy among the bun community. It will take all my willpower not to eat these immediately. Oh my gosh, do bunnies really love having bananas? Is that like a thing? Can I put the banana tree in the greenhouse? Okay, it cannot be planted outside and not near the greenhouse. Okay, so we're gonna have to plant the banana tree somewhere else. And I kind of feel like planting it over here where it will very exotically sort of grow in the corner. So we're gonna go ahead and we're going to put our two banana trees. Okay, can't put them too close. What about over here? All right, what about over here? Yay! Okay, so now we've got our two banana trees down here in the front. This is so exciting. And welcome back to Funhouse, everyone. I hope you are all having an absolutely amazing day. It looks like today is going to be a day of wonderful fruit harvest for us. The pears and the oranges are already going. Pretty soon we will have the peaches and the plums going too. And also we have now managed to unlock a whole bunch more tropical trees. I am so tickled and delighted. We might actually have to go ahead and get that koi pond and then maybe back here we'll sort of start like a tropical plant area and I could even put in a bunch of the shades kind of like these things out and about so that we could go ahead and we could actually have more areas where we can put the ferns that normally grow best in the greenhouse out here. This is gonna be so fun! Ooh, and look! The bees actually want a new plant. Oh, that's really good. Which plant do they want? Let me let me check the plantpedia. And our beloved bees are actually searching for Is it the primaria? No, I think they're looking for the lupines. But let me like make super sure. Yes! Okay, so our bees are actually looking for lupines and we can totally satisfy that desire because we have a bunch of lupines. Can I separate the Okay, so the lupines need a medium garden bed, which means that I'm going to need a medium plant pot to go ahead and put that lupine in. And we also have some new seeds that I actually need to plant inside. Oh my goodness, this is all escalating very quickly. <laughs> but let me go ahead and we will get a medium bucket plant. And then let's come over and I think... Now I really want to look at all of the new plants. There we go, lemon, lime, mango. Oh my gosh, I love mangoes. So let's actually buy a mango tree as well. And I do want to start putting out some of our ferns, like some of the button ferns and some of the more tropical looking plants that could maybe go outside, like the common lady fern. So we just need to have like a really good shaded spot and then I could put a bunch of common lady ferns and some petonia out there. Maybe some forget-me-not sort of mixed in as well. And we can have a more tropical section that we could try to mix in with our wonderful like tropical plants. Uh, let's see, and lupines could just go out without any... Lupines and roses we could plant out there with no problem. Hmm... And then we still have more things where I need to improve our greenhouse to unlock a bunch more plants. Does that mean maybe expand our greenhouse? We'll have to try it out. We'll have to see. But for now, I think I've grown these Zabridias. But just in case I haven't, I bought a couple seeds and we have a couple medium pots. And we'll try growing them to see if we can unlock more of the flowers and continue being a great botanist bun bun. Having our before and after, I should take some pictures, <laughs> of continuing to see how our life has an effect and we're able to make a difference and we're able to, to change our greenhouse every time we show up. And maybe change a little bit about our relationship with each other and just hanging out together too. Because today, I finally, finally, finally am going to answer some of the questions that our patrons have left in. Oh no, go back in there. Oh, thank goodness. That our patrons have left in our patron Q&A section that we have in our Discord. Which also our Twitch subs get access to as well, which is always so sweet. Because then people are able to like gift that to each other and it just warms my heart so much. All right, let me check like 
the lupines actually need to be out and exposed to the sun. So I'm going to actually plant the lupine. Let's see. I have a watering thing. I don't have a dirt thing. I should probably put a dirt thing over here. But I'm going to plant the lupine back there. Because that way it will grow. And I should probably save up some carrots so we can get... We can go ahead and we can get a dirt tosser for keeping the soil really good for the outdoor plants there too. All right, let's propagate this lupine, get our bees happy. Then we can start making a little bit of money by gathering up some of our fruit. And I'm finally going to answer some of the questions that you guys have been leaving because, oh my goodness, it has been busy. And I have not been the best at answering questions. I apologize for that. I, well, no, no, I don't apologize because we were having a great time just kind of chit-chatting the last several episodes of our Bun House adventures together. So, all right, as we gather up this fruit, and I, once again, I'm going to try to think about some cute before and after pictures of our garden as we continue to take good care of it and improve it and it continues to grow. Uh, let's get into it. And we're actually going to dive in with Magnolia, who asked a couple of fun questions about animals. Because as you guys know, I am all about the natural world. Oh, look at all of our plants. Oh, this is so fun. But I am all about the natural world. And one of my passions is spreading that passion for just life with you guys. I think one of the most frustrating things when I was growing up was that nobody in my family, nobody at school, nobody anywhere in my life seemed to be as totally freaked out and in love with plants as I was. No one seemed to want to jump up and down and be like, oh my gosh, the world is so beautiful. Oh my goodness. I can't believe how gorgeous everything is. Can you believe snakes exist? They are so cool. Can you believe like the jungle exists, that ecosystems function the way they do? I was in love with all of that very early on. And it felt like nobody was freaking out as much as me when they saw a bird or a beautiful plant or uh, to learn a cool new nature fact. And one of the best things that has ever happened to me is being able to create this little pixel biology community to share that passion. Yay, look at all the fruit we collected. That was really fun. <laughs> but one of the best things that has ever happened to me is creating this pixel biology community so we can really just share that passion for, yeah, wow, holy cow, this world we share is so awesome. So Magnolia, thank you so much for asking me questions about animals. And the first question you asked me is if I have a favorite extinct animal. And I actually don't, uh, like off the top of my head, not because I don't think extinct animals are cool, but because it'd be so hard to like pick a favorite, I sort of get stuck with like the favorite animal question over and over again, <laughs> because they're all so amazing. But a, a extinct animal that's kind of on the, the top of my mind that I think is really amazing is actually the giant sloth. There used to be giant sloth that lived in North Carolina, which is where Chips and I currently live. And they have this huge giant sloth skeleton on display at the Natural History Museum in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I think it's just one of the coolest things ever. I get so tickled whenever we get to go and we get to see it because it is gigantic. It stands, I think, like 10, maybe 12 feet tall. And I mean, you guys have seen modern day sloths. <laughs> I just have a really hard time picturing what a, a 10 foot tall sloth would have moved like. And that's one of the reasons I love seeing all of the research and the, the advancements that people are now able to make. Ooh, and let's actually grab our little tropical plant and start a tropical plant section. With being able to research more about how there we go, yay! But being able to research more about how animals moved based on their bones. So that is something that prehistoric um, and extinct animal researchers are able to go ahead and do now. And then let's get, let's see, can I get another mango tree? <gasps> Almost, not quite. All right, we're getting more lemons and limes. I kind of want to put a banana back there again. So I'm going to get another banana just because we can. Yay! How's our bananas doing? Oh my gosh, they're doing great. This is so exciting. We'll go inside and we'll, we'll work on the real money makers whilst we wait for these fruit trees to come in. 
but researchers are now able to use computer programs and math and the science that they have really advanced to take the bones of extinct creatures and do a lot of studies on how those animals would have actually moved. And the end results are so fascinating, especially with dinosaurs, which I know a lot of you guys are really, really into. But I would love to see how did a giant sloth move? I'm so used to seeing sloths be something that moves very, very slowly. But other than like the Alberta and Galapagos tortoises, I can't think of anything big, big in modern day that I know that moves very slowly. Giraffes kind of meander, but they can hoof it, like puns intended, because they, you know, they have hooves uh, when they really want to. And elephants can run. Oh my gosh, I would, I would never, ever, 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 ever in my entire life want to be on flat ground next to an elephant, even if it was in the distance and I wasn't like in a vehicle or able to get out of the way very quickly because an elephant, when it decides to charge, like you're, you're up a creek, my friends, <laughs> you're in trouble. Uh, so I want to know how did the sloth move? One of the key features we think about with sloths is that they're super slow, but was a large sloth fast? So if you take away the slowness, what are other defining features of a sloth? Like, am I being biased and just thinking like, oh, sloths are really slow? Like, did it swim a lot? I know modern day sloths swim quite a bit. And that's one of the ways that they're able to actually get around a little quicker than, than climbing and walking actually, um, and crawling. So did, was it just more flooded in this part of what is now North America when the sloth was around? So yeah, I have a lot of questions and I think that that's kind of the best way to greet any of the information that we have about extinct creatures is often the dinosaur and the, the prehistoric animal community can be really a, a stressful place to try to get into because people want to become very confident in what they know and they want to really push that on people and Basically, it's it's kind of scary to be around people who are aggressive about loving dinosaurs and aggressive about loving prehistoric life because they can be really mean. <laughs> Trust me, on the on, I've been on the receiving end of that for years when it comes to playing a lot of dinosaur games. And I think what happens is people just get so passionate and excited that they just really want to have everything be right about what they know and right about the way people pronounce dinosaur names and right about what, wh how this dinosaur really lived. But then I'm old enough and I've seen enough of life now to see how really, if you give it a little bit of time, like the information we have about a lot of the creatures that we share our planet with, even the ones that exist right now and we can see with our own eyes at this moment, changes all of the time. The The information that I know about a lot, like almost, I can't really think of, of many animals where I haven't had to update the information that I learned when I was younger to the information that comes out with the advances in science that we have now. And so I think what happens is people just really want to be so right about prehistoric animals that they get super like, how dare you pronounce it like this? Like, clearly you don't care about dinosaurs the way I do. Because they're passionate about something and it feels nice to kind of be right about the things that you're passionate about. But then that information that they were like making somebody else feel bad about not knowing uh, ends up changing in five years when new research comes out. So I think the best way to approach thinking about prehistoric animals and the best way to approach thinking about life that existed before in a way that we can't really remember it, like, uh, like we weren't around and we can only kind of have our best guesses, is instead of trying to get it right and instead of stressing about like, what do we absolutely know that is gonna be the bedrock of science forever and always going to be correct, we should really be thinking more about life in terms of what what curiosity does it spark and how can we pursue that curiosity 
So in the past few years, I have been able to approach the idea of learning more about prehistoric animals without as much fear as before, because I didn't really want to learn more about dinosaurs before. If I was going to get yelled at by the, the, the dinosaur fan people about not knowing the right, the right way to say things or not knowing the right information about it. And I think that's such a pity because I think the legacy that we should have from prehistoric past, from the life that existed on this planet before we were even the twinkle in some primate's eye is it should be curiosity and awe. That is what we should get out of prehistoric life more than facts that we can ramble off from a Wikipedia page that is going to change in like two years. <laughs> we should be able to collectively look back on the fact that almost all the life that has ever existed on this planet, millions and millions and millions of years worth of life of living creatures that, that had favorite flavors of plants that they would eat, that had favorite places they would nest, that had social interactions with one another that would cuddle the way that you can see, uh, like animals cuddle now, that, that lived on our planet they came before us and they're gone. And instead of making it a fact-knowing contest, I wish what we had about that prehistoric past is just awe of, of the ability to kind of look at each other and be like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And then to be able to be curious about that era together and use that curiosity to allow us to look around at the way that life works now, at the things that are alive now. Oh, oh, I dropped our plant. <laughs> and, and to appreciate it more and to also try to just wonder. I think the, the, only, the only true legacy, the, or I should say, I think the best legacy of the past and of all of the, the countless life forms that have come before us and are no longer shouldn't be getting the facts right, though that can be an element and that can be fun and important in its own way, but it should just be curiosity, awe, and wonder for our world that allow us to enjoy the time we have. So I didn't expect to go on that ramble. Apparently I just go on lots of, I'm blushing right now. You guys can't see it, but I'm actually hardcore blushing right now because I just realized I have pulled up all these questions to answer and what does Siri do? She goes off on one question basically the whole time, but I didn't realize I had reached that point. So thank you very much, Magnolia. Oh my gosh, I have had the question over and over again over the years of what's my favorite extinct animal and I have never answered it like that because I think I'm finally able to say my like I, why I love learning about extinct animals. I don't want to get the details and the facts right the way that it's really fun to rattle off facts about like the, the, the animals that are currently existing. I love telling you guys about details that we know about those but I think my favorite thing about prehistoric animals is that they just leave you with such a sense of like, wow. And that I'm actually ready to go ahead and start learning more about them because I'm not going to be bullied away from people who are going to be like, you pronounced it wrong anymore. Because I love our world too much and I want to share how amazing it is too much to let people chase me away from it anymore. Also, that's a cool banana tree. But all right, so that was a long-winded question. I can answer your next question. Do you have a favorite species of giraffe a lot faster? The answer is the mossy eye giraffe because they really do look so much like a puzzle piece in my opinion. How's our little mango tree doing? Doing good. But I really love the mossy eye giraffe because uh, the reticulated giraffes and others other giraffes of those varieties tend to have uh, very square looking spots, but the mossy eye giraffe has a really chaotic looking set of spots that I think are quite adorable uh, and just remind me of kind of like an organic abstract painting. And I very much love that. But thank you, Magnolia. Holy moly, I did not expect to like go down that little path, uh, but we've already accepted that while we change our garden, Siri is definitely a before and after rambler. <clears throat> And uh, I'll try to answer a couple more questions. <laughs> so let's see, uh, from the Lord of Thunder, a fantastic and relevant question. Uh oh, and I better check what which plant is not doing well. Why, how can I help? Oh dear. 
Really? These potos? Bad dirt quality? Aha! I can fix that. Yeet, my dirt. Yeet. Alright, yeah, that should be taken care of it in no time. But Lord of Thunder, you ask, from 1 to 10, how much do you enjoy hearing the sound caused by the rapid expan expansion of air surrounding the path of a lightning bolt, aka thunder? How much on a scale of 1 to 10 do I enjoy the sound of thunder? So fun fact, I actually caught this moment on video and if you guys want to go back and look at the vlogs of when Chips and I lived in Taiwan for a summer while he was doing some studying there for his PhD, uh, I'm actually a little bit scared of lightning and thunder now. Just a bit. I didn't used to be scared of lightning and thunder, but it happened because every afternoon when we lived in Taiwan, we would get these thunderstorms, these powerful monsoon-esque thunderstorms. They would usually arrive around 1 to 2 p.m. in the afternoon, and they would stay for about an hour, and they would just crash overhead. The lightning would flash. The streets would flood a little bit. Uh, they were built to handle this, so they wouldn't flood for too long, but the streets were still flooding for at least a little bit. And we would have all of this thunder, like, uh, and lightning just crash overhead in the middle of the city. And it was so beautiful. And it was so surreal to see these gigantic, huge bolts of lightning hit the skyscrapers around us because we were in Taipei. And Taipei, for those of you guys who don't know, is a huge city. It is gigantic. It is the biggest city in Taiwan. And you you didn't have like nature around you. you had just a sea of skyscrapers and the lightning would be hitting the skyscrapers right next to us so uh i leaned out one day to get a little bit of that on video and i had done that a few times already before no problem and just as i opened the door to go ahead and lean out and just like really quickly get a little bit of the video of this intense storm Unlucky for me, and this is why I'm sharing this story, so hopefully you guys will avoid this, a huge bolt of lightning hit the skyscraper right next to us. And they have these, they have these lightning rods on top of them so that they can actually do this. It's, it's a feature, not a bug. <laughs> but the lightning bolt hit the skyscraper literally right next to us and it hurt my ears so bad. Years later, it's been about four years now, maybe five, and I still have ear problems in my right ear now because I thought it would be fun to get a bit of the video and I was so distracted with this idea of like, oh wow, this will be so cool, I can show you guys the monsoon. I forgot to respect the fact that I, it, this was still a dangerous storm. And I forgot to respect the fact that even if all I did was open the sliding glass door and lean out, not even like a foot out of the door, it made it so that when that bolt hit next to us, the sound wave and the effect of the, the, the thunder hurt my ear, <laughs> like significantly to the point where I have hearing problems that are developing worse as I get older. So I'm actually kind of scared of lightning and thunder now up close. I won't go outside anymore during those storms, not because I'm afraid I'm going to get hit by a bolt of lightning, but because I'm afraid I'm going to ruin the rest of my hearing. <laughs> so I love hearing it in music. I love hearing it in the distance. I love hearing it if all of the doors and windows are closed so I don't have to worry about going deaf. But I have changed from my storm chasing ways of my youth to having a lot more respect <laughs> for the fact that you should respect lightning and thunder. Uh, so there's my little story about that, Lord of Thunder. And I feel a little bad because I feel like I should just like all praise the wonders of nature. Um, but I, I, there were big consequences that I am suffering years later because of that moment and because of kind of just thinking about oh it's so beautiful and just focusing on like oh wow it's so gorgeous and i love it so much i forgot it's still a force of nature i'm just a human little little bean of collection of cells who's mostly made up of you know my gut bacteria more than human genes <laughs> uh lightning did not care the thunder and lightning did not care 
if I was around and it did not care if it was gonna like hurt my hearing. So please respect it. Even when it's amazing, even when it's wonderful, even when you love it, remember that does not change the fact that you're just a human little bean made up mostly of gut bacteria that I hope you're taking good care of and feeding plenty of lettuce. But alright guys, thank you so much for joining me. Once again, I had no idea where that ramble was going, but I have to say, now that we have been doing more and more in Bunhouse, and now that we're seeing like all of these hilarious stories, I don't know where these are coming from, but now that I have really rambled so much about these things, I have to say these are some of my favorite experiences of the last week of the things that we have been doing. So thank you all for joining me. We have some new plants and please feel free to leave more stories uh, or more, uh, well, I guess you can leave more questions and they will transform into stories for little Q and A's for next time. I hope you all are having a wonderful day. You're staying safe from lightning and thunder. You are appreciating the fact that we are just a tiny sliver of all life that have ever existed on this planet. And I will share more of these adventures with you guys next time. So if you could, do please leave a like for our little botanist bun bun and the silly Siri. And if you'd like to join us on this and literally thousands more adventures, do please consider subscribing. But most importantly, my friends, Stay curious, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.